working? All right. I made the mistake once before being here uh, and preached here before of having both mics going at the same time and uh, temporarily deaf to everybody before I started my sermon, which is a great way to, to kick it off. Um, <laughs> I, I want to uh, start by, by thanking um, the elders of the East Foothill Church of Christ for giving me this opportunity. It's been quite some time since I've been here. And I want to thank specifically Derek and Kathy for visiting the Monterey Peninsula Church of Christ when we were doing a How We Got the Bible series by Mike Wilson, uh, which is over there in Santa Clara. He's the preacher there if you have not heard of him. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kyle Posey. I come from a a lineage of preachers, but I do not profess to be one. I just clearly uh, indicate what the message is. Uh, from the Bible. And so if there's anything that you hear or say this morning that is contrary to what you believe the truth is, please have a discussion with me afterwards, because my objective is to preach the truth to you, to give you God's word in its purest form, which is the truth. Okay? All right. I wanted to get that out of the way. You know, it's kind of curious. I think of two stories when I uh, look out into this podium, and I One of them is that I was a seven-year-old kid when my dad came and preached here for the first time. And my dad's name is Chuck Posey. And he says, it felt like I was walking forever down that hallway. (laughs) And for those of you who have been to the Monterey Church of Christ, it's about uh, a third the size of this building. And I remember this church being huge when I was seven. And when I came back and visited again, I was like, it shrunk by three times. What's going on here? I also grew by about three times. So... Uh, The second story I think of is I think of an old member that used to attend here who was an elder, and his name was uh, Lalo Enriquez. And uh, Lalo and Loretta um, are both very fond to me, and I get emotional thinking about it because Lalo and Loretta were such a good impact on my family. And for those of you who don't know, my dad uh, had dealt with some sins in the 70s and the 80s, and he had completely fallen out of the church the way... Uh, brothers were treating him. Everywhere, every church he went to, he would get a second eye. He wasn't allowed to lead uh, prayers. I mean, it was, it was a terrible instance. And he had, he had committed a sin that was uh, pretty bad. I won't get into the depth of that sin for his privacy, but what I will say is, uh, after he had married my mother and they had their first child, my mom was pregnant with me, and Lalo caught wind that my dad was not attending services. And he found out from my grandfather, Leroy Posey, that my dad was not attending services, somebody who had grown up in the church and had gone to church his entire life. And as a result, Lalo took it upon himself to go and preach the message to both of my parents. My mom had been a Mormon since she was born. And Lalo, as a result of leading her to the truth and taking her through the book of Acts, my mom was a baptized Christian in the summer of 1992, four months before I was born. I owe a lot to that man, (laughs) because number one, I didn't want to be a Mormon. (laughs) Number two, it really kick-started my dad's relationship with God again. And my dad tells a story that he speaks from the pulpit of Lalo telling him and being on the phone with him. And he was saying, are you guys attending services? My dad says, no, we haven't attended services in years. And Lalo goes, you know, as a preacher's son, that's unacceptable behavior. And I think that's what my dad needed to hear. Was a a man who was stalwart in his faith towards God, knew that he didn't know it all, And also didn't judge my father, but instead extended a hand of peace to him and brought him back to the church. And as a result, I am up here now preaching the word of God to you all. So it's incredible how a little thing that may seem insignificant can lead to the instance that we're in now. Okay, so I say all that to here we go. It was working. (laughs) Oh, okay. I think it's fired up now. There we go. Okay. I say all that to lead with what the message is going to be today. Um, I promised you I would deliver you the truth. And the only way to do that is to remove my opinion 
from the message I'm about to teach. It's going to be heavily scripturally based today, but I want to focus on a couple things. Number one, we already had our, our scripture reading, which is Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The two things we're going to look at today is what exactly is evil, okay? And then we're going to do a contrast of what exactly is good. Now this, just to preface, is merely scratching the surface of this uh, topic in the Bible, okay? So uh, I had a joke with Kennedy earlier that I was going to wake you all up with my booming voice and then put you back to sleep again with all the scripture that's up on the board. So I hope that you can stick with me, and I promise uh, that this message will be one uh, that you wish you would have heard. So if we look at what evil is, um, we can look at the Greek word that's used in Romans 12, 21, which is kakos, okay, uh, meaning bad, inwardly foul, or rotten, okay? So what I think about when I think of something that is inwardly foul or rotten is, uh, has anybody ever gone camping before? By a show of hands, doesn't look like anyone. Okay, there we go. All right. I was like, nobody here has been camping. Um, when I see a tree stump, and yet I step on it to get a foothold, and the whole thing just crumbles beneath me, and I lose my footing, that to me would be inward rot. Okay? Evil is defined in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary as having bad qualities, which lend or tend to injure or produce mischief, to be wicked, corrupt, perverse, and wrong. Okay? Evil is defined in a moral sense by using God as the standard of what is good. It's really important that we pay attention to that, right? Because throughout this entire sermon, we're going to be comparing to God. And for those of you that are professed Christians that come to church and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to know that nothing we can do can ever amount to what Jesus did for us. And that's really important. Because to put yourself in the shoes and to say that you're good enough, you are not. You will never be good enough. There's only one that can be called good, and that is God. Oops, I had one more point on there. Uh, it's important for us to understand that in John 8, 44, Satan is called a murderer from the beginning and father of lies. Okay, That gives us an indication of what this evil might be. And then we get to Proverbs 6, 16, 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. We're going to see a lot more of this coming up. I see good versus evil as a rivalry. Do we have any 49er fans here today? By a show of hands. Can I see those hands? All right, I got the, the tech guy waving in the back, okay? <laughs> he's really excited that he's a 49er fan. Well, it's great, because I can keep you all day since your game is tomorrow. You don't have to worry about getting home. Who are you guys' number one rivalry against? Need I even say the word? The Cowboys. <laughs> the Cowboys versus, are you a Cowboys fan? All right. More power to you, sister, but we all know who's going to win in the playoffs. Uh, so we got 49er fans here. We got Cowboys fans here. That would be considered a rivalry, right? One could even say that the fans hate each other, right? That's right. You don't because why? You have Christ, <laughs> right? Right, so you have love, not hate. One could say a Giants fan doesn't think too fondly of a Dodger fan. My dad was a Dodger fan, and I got him to convert to a Giants fan, so I'm really proud about that. That's a rivalry. You don't see eye to eye. You believe in different morals, values, and, and this is just looking at the base level of teams, obviously. But good and evil is so much more than that. Good and evil goes physically, mentally, spiritually. They are a rivalry. What exactly is evil? Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. 
Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexually immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. Do you get the point? Is it resonating yet? And he says, in these things I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they are evil. They don't belong in the presence of the Lord. James 3, 14 through 16, But if you have bitter jealousy, jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. This is some really heavy stuff that we're looking at here. If there's a verse that has resonated with me in the last 10 years more than any verse within the Bible, there's actually three of them. Romans 12, 21, which we looked at. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. None come through the Father except through me. And I'm not going to memorize 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, but I'll read it now. This really resonates with me because I see what has changed just over the last 10 years. And my dad, who's been alive for 71 years, has seen the change in the world from when he grew up in the 50s to now. To what's being allowed in schools. To what we're being taught. I remember standing up every day at school, putting my hand over my heart, and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And then it became, well, you don't really have to say that anymore. And how about we remove the under God away from that, that, that a pledge there? Isn't that what this nation was founded on? Or at least that's what we think. So is the world moving more towards a good aspect, or is it moving more towards an evil one? I think it's moving more towards an evil one, because this domain is not ours. It's not God's. This is Satan's domain. And where he is let, allowed to go play, he's going to play. So let's read this together. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of money, lovers of self, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. From among them, for among them, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, get this, always learning, and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Mm, mm, mm. That last line there, to me, shows that there are individuals that want to learn everything that is not of God. They want to put their faith in a book over the Lord. They want to lead people astray instead of lead people to is this resonating yet? Does it make sense? We are in these times now, sisters and brethren. These are the times that we're in now where we have people like this right outside that door. We have them in every city we walk. And yet, all of you have decided on Sunday morning to gather in the safe haven of a place to gather with fellow Christians that put God first. So we can avoid these type of people and we can get a recharging. So when we go out and teach the gospel to them, it's okay if they reject us because God will work on their heart. James 4, 15 through 17. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Next slide, please. I don't think it's working. Thank you. 
Uh, James 1, 14 through 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Just click the screen. Have I made this clear enough? (laughs) We live in this. We're a part of it. But we're not to be involved in it. Okay, Uh, yeah. So evil is to injure, to hurt. Evil is to be wicked, to be corrupt, to be rotten, to be envious, to lie, to murder, to maliciously plot or scheme, to run towards evil, to be a false witness, to cause divisions, to be prideful, to be arrogant, to be bitter and jealous, to be sexually immoral, to be full of anger with intent to hurt and destroy, to be lover of self, money, and pleasure, to be disobedient, to be against all things God is. Now, by a show of hands, who wants to be in a place with these people continually? By a show of hands. Do you want to be dealing with this all the time? Nonstop? I could barely deal with it for 10 minutes out there. So what evil means is that there's no grace, there's no salvation, there's no inheritance, no communication, no joy, no peace, no love, no redemption, no Lord, no sacrifice, no future. Mm -mm -mm. I don't like this word evil anymore. I never did. That's what it means. But we know that that isn't what we're left here with. Who can tell me where this sermon's going? (laughs) You know, if we look at Barry Schwartz in his book, The Paradox of Choice, he says the following, learning to choose is hard. Learning to choose well is harder. And learning to choose well in a world of unlimited possibilities is harder still, perhaps too hard. You know what I think of Barry Schwartz when I read that quote? This brother does not have the Lord. (laughs) Because every decision that you make when you have God as the forefront in your life is an easy one. Because if you make a choice based off of life or death, and that's how you view every decision that you make, the choice will be as clear as day. What is the right thing to do? We have to think of every choice that we make as a life or death situation. But I'm not talking physically. I'm talking a spiritual life and a spiritual death that exists if I don't choose God overall. If I don't put God first. If I don't follow the most important commandments that the Bible has listed out for me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in that, the entire law is complete. And so we know, being Christians, that this evil that I just listed off, these these scriptures that I just read, are for those who have not been saved. And we have been saved. There is an opportunity that's been presented to us through the Son of God. Evil has been overcome. Romans 3, 24, 26. Right before it says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Or right after, excuse me. It says, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. By his blood. Does anybody know what propitiation means? It means a wiping away of. Propitiation is a, whenever you see that word and you're like, propiti what? It's a wiping away. 
So God put forward as a wiping away by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Who here has faith in Jesus? There, see every hand up. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an interactive <laughs> speaker, if you can't tell already. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. And if it ended there, that was the rest of the scripture, I would be depressed. <laughs> because I was that. Following passions of my flesh. Carrying out the desires of my body and mind whenever I wanted to. But, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Amen? Okay. Amen. By grace you have been saved and raised up us up with, uh, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by, your gra by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. This is what it means when evil has been overcome. There is now no longer a death that is eternal for us. There was. That's gone. <laughs> because Jesus made it so through his sacrifice. He conquered this death. So what it really boils down to is a choice. At this point, I've shown you what evil is. I've shown you that it's been conquered. I've shown you the repercussions of what it's like if you stay in evil and what you will go without if you continue down an evil path. But really, the choice is up to us. God has given us the example and the framework that we need to put the pieces together in this beautiful brain he's given us that can problem solve and put together equations and figure it out to comprehend his scripture. There's a reason why a third grader can pick up the Bible and understand the main message. Because it is so simple. And yet, we overcomplicate things. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. I cannot imagine what it would feel like to have somebody come up to me and say, 
Brother Kyle Posey, I think you're a child of the devil. And I think it's because of this example and this example and this example and this example. Do you know how hard my heart would drop if that were the case? If I had nothing that could save me, or better yet, if I had something that could save me, and I chose not to partake in it. And now I've chosen to be a child of the devil. I have, as Hebrews 10 says, trampled Jesus' blood underfoot. I would personally hate that. 1 John 2, 15, 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I don't know about you, but I want to abide forever. It's happening again. All right, there we go. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by their brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the grace of the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, with himself, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Sounds pretty good to me. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Can someone tell me what Jesus is likened to in, in John, the first chapter? He is likened to the light. And what does the light do? It not only exposes the darkness, but it pushes it away. I believe you find that in John 1, verses 4 and 5. Jim Rohn once said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I want us to focus on the last part there. This can include the Lord too. Why is it when we think of the five people that we spend the average most time with, if you're that average? And some don't believe with this philosophy, and I understand why. But why aren't you including the Lord in that group of five? Why aren't you gathering understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ and the plan and all things that are God to make him as part of your average? Because in actuality, God should not be the average. It should consume us. God should consume us. It should be every thought, every desire, every will that we have. Now, I'm a man. Oops. I'm a man speaking to men and women here today. And I can tell you that I don't do that. But I think it takes a level of humility to recognize that we can't do that. And so where do we get our strength and courage from? From the Lord. That's why we pray, earnestly pray. And we ask for him not doubting his ability to give us that uh, inspiration, but we have confidence that he will give us that. So include the Lord in your top five. <laughs> it's funny because it vibrates every time it reactivates. Uh, so when we start to look at things that are good, the only way to compare what really good is, is to compare to God. So God is so good. 
James 1, 17 and 18, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow, due to change. Of his own will he, will he uh, bring us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. James 3.17 and 18, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We're almost done, I promise. Galatians 5, 22 through 25, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why do you think that? It's not a rhetorical question. Why is there no law against these things, these fruits? Because the things they produce are good. Not just for yourself, but for everybody. That's why there's no law against them. Because if I love my brother, if I love my enemy, if I show joy or peace towards my enemy or my brother, they're not going to come away from that feeling like they were shorted or feeling like they've been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Feeling like they haven't, uh, that they came out of the deal wrongly. Things like murder hurt. Not only the person that it happens to, but the family surrounding that individual. Lies hurt. Not only the, yourself as a person, but the people that you're telling them to. And I can go on and on and on about how evil hurts and affects. And that's why is there, there is a law against them. But for these things, because they produce things that are good and joyous and fruitful, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Romans 8.28 Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we pray for as we ought. Charles, this is the point that you brought up a little bit earlier. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. I believe that with all my heart, that if there's a trial or a tribulation that any of y'all are going through right now, God has put you there to not only test you, but so that the good may come from whatever this might be. And I can say that I've had trials in my life where I didn't know where the end would take me. I didn't know that my prayers were being answered just in a way that I didn't expect it to be. But the end result resulted in my faith growing. My confidence in God increasing. Romans 5, 6 through 11, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For once, well, uh, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. John 3.16 in 17, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I want to be saved through Jesus Christ. So this is how we overcome evil. Overcome evil with reproof. Overcome evil with teaching, with correction, with training in righteousness. Overcome evil with the word of truth, with peace, with gentleness, with reasonableness, with a heart full of mercy, with sincerity, with hospitality, with kindness, with joyfulness, with self-control, with keeping in step with the Spirit, with obedience, with boldness, with suffering, with confidence, with sacrifice, and finally, overcome evil with love. So really, when it comes down to it, once we've made that choice, once we've seen the game plan that God has for us, I have a question. Who shall separate us? Who can do that? The answer is nothing if we have made that choice. Romans 8, 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. You know what Jesus said? If they hate you, know that they hated me first. We are experiencing the same things that Jesus experiences. I don't believe this country has gone topsy-turvy yet. But the question that we're going to need to ask ourselves is when it does, when something like this isn't allowed anymore, when I have to make a choice on who I'm going to follow, do I preserve my life and run? Or do I stand firm for God and for truth? What will your decision be? For I am sure no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is power right there. That means that Jesus has not only conquered, but nothing can separate us from his love. Finally, Revelation 5, 2 through 5. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Who's crying here? John the Apostle. John the Apostle is crying because he's standing by a treasure chest and no one is worthy to open that scroll. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has what? Conquered over death. So that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So there we have it, that Jesus is the only one worthy of carrying out the judgments that are to come. He's the only one worthy of sacrificing and dying on the behalf of our sins. And as a result, he receives all authority and recognition and honor and glory.
So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I hope what I've left you with here this morning is a small, scratchable surface of just what the Bible carries and holds. And I've picked uh, some of the most profound scriptures where if you were to Google this, these would probably pop up. There's tons that you can find in Psalms. Uh, There's tons that you can find in Proverbs in regards to good and what is good and evil. But if I can leave you with one thing here this morning, it's that this rivalry, it's really only worth picking one side. I don't want to say that the Cowboys are evil in this regard and that the 49ers are good because no matter which fan you pick, it could be viewed the other way. But what I do know is that there is an eternal battle happening right now. One that involves good and evil. And if we pick what is good, we're going to receive things that are of the Lord. If we don't, then this is what awaits us. I don't want any of us, despite having all these, I don't, any, I don't want any of us to have no Lord, no sacrifice, and no future. So we bring things up like this, and we talk about them. <clears throat> because tomorrow may be too late. That's actually a perfect song to end on. Um... Again, I want to thank the elders for the opportunity to speak here this morning. You know, Christ is oftentimes in early stages of life pushed aside thinking that, eh, when we get older, there will be a time and a place where I can come back to him. But I really want to focus on this last slide here, which is tomorrow may be too late. You may not have an opportunity tomorrow to do that. God forbid, you might lose your life today. And if you look at your situation and you compare it to 1 John, the fourth chapter, when he says that we are to draw confidence to the day of judgment because God loves us. For there is no fear in love. Do I have that confidence that on the day of judgment, I will be a sheep on his right-hand side. And if I don't, what am I doing to get there? That is the message I would like to share with you all today. We are all fighters of injustice and of evil. We want to continue doing good. I encourage you in that journey. I encourage you to share the message of good with all that you come in contact with, not knowing if tomorrow may be too late. I hope this resonates with you, as it has me. Uh, For those of you who are Christians, um, we welcome this time for you to come up and share maybe struggles or things that you're going through. Um, This is the reason why Christ developed this church body, was so that we could support and help one another in times of need, but to also be there in a world of sin. And for those of you who have not made the choice to follow Christ and have been baptized for the remission of your sins, All those things that I listed there today, that is what awaits for you. And I'm not really one to sugarcoat things. I'm very direct. So, um, yeah, I don't really have to apologize for that, I don't think. Uh, I am direct in that that world of evil awaits you. That world that you will live in eternally, away from God, away from all things that are good, they don't call it hell because of the fire that exists. They call it hell because it's an eternal separation from the Lord our God. I don't want to see anyone in here go through that or suffer through that. So continue to do what is right. Continue to do what is pure. Continue to follow the truth from bookend to bookend. And that is my lesson this morning. Let us stand and sing at this time.